Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to High Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. Jesus is truly King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and the Holy Bible is our only standard and authority for truth. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today is December the 11th in the year of our Lord, 2017, and this is one a day for the soul. Now, I trust that you are feeling blessed in Jesus this morning and that you are at a state of perfect rest and peace through his spirit. Well, we're continuing our study in the book of Romans. And before we begin this morning, because if you've been reading along with us, you may be feeling a bit overwhelmed by Paul's writing style. And so I want to take you to Peter's second letter. And in chapter 3, beginning in the middle of verse 15, Peter, a disciple of the Lord Jesus, one whom walked with the Lord Jesus throughout his entire ministry, and so you would think that he would have a better understanding and grasp of what being a follower of the Lord Jesus is truly all about. And yet Peter says, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you, so also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things in which are some things hard to be understood. And so if you feel like you're having a hard time understanding the book of Romans, you're not alone, friends. Even the disciples, the closest followers of the Lord Jesus, had a difficult time understanding what Paul was trying to say. And so the best way for us to do that is to try to keep the sequence of the letter in its context. And so when we last left off together, Paul was basically establishing who Jesus is and who the people of God are. And one is not a Jew based upon his birthright. One is a Jew based upon the new birth. And that's what he finishes in chapter 2 verse 28 and 29 by saying, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly or by flesh or by birthright, but he is a Jew, verse 29, who is one inwardly and circumcision is that of the heart, not the flesh. It's of the spirit, not the letter. And so keeping this in mind, as we move into chapter three, the very first question Paul asks is that what advantage then hath the Jew. If one is not a Jew by birthright, what advantage does he have? Well, in much every way, chiefly because unto them, the Jews, were committed the oracles or the declarations of God, what we would call the laws of God, the instructions of God. You see, what is now known as the Christian faith had its beginnings with the man Abraham, which is where the Jewish faith began. And so we are not to look down upon them because they have rejected their Messiah, but we are to regard them because if it had not been for them, Messiah would never have come. Now, Paul acknowledges the fact in verse three that there are those who do not believe, but just because they do not believe, shall their unbelief make the faith of God without effect? In other words, does their unbelief change who God is? And the answer would be, of course not. God is unchanging. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It is people who have changed. Men were never meant to deny the living God. It was God's design that they should always acknowledge and worship him. It is man who has changed, not God. And so just because man changes doesn't mean that God does. God still desires men everywhere to worship him. For God is true and every man is a liar. Left upon his own, there is no good in him. And so Paul standing upon this principle of an unchanging God in verse five says, if our unrighteousness, our sinfulness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unrighteous who takes vengeance? Do you remember in Romans chapter 1 verse 20 when we were there, we read the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that they are without excuse. 
So Paul is saying just because some do not believe doesn't mean that they have an excuse before God, for he has clearly presented himself to them through creation itself. But if in their disbelief, back to verse 5 in chapter 3, if in their unrighteousness, the righteousness of God is demonstrated even greater, does that mean that God becomes unrighteous because he takes vengeance upon those who have denied him, who have rejected him, who are living in unrighteousness? And so basically what Paul is saying is, look, light cannot be appreciated until it's compared to darkness. For it is the darkness that makes the light seem so bright. And so it is the shame of men, the unrighteousness of men, that makes the glory of God more intense. God, in all of his glory, is seen more magnificent and more beautiful, more wondrous and awesome when compared to the darkness, the evil, to the hate and to the destructive ways of his greatest enemy, Lucifer, Satan. And so Paul says in verse 6, God forbid, for how shall God judge the world? If God is made unrighteous by the unrighteousness of men, then how can an unrighteous God judge unrighteous people? No, he must remain righteous. And even though men have chosen dark and evil ways, even in the simplest form of unbelief, God still remains righteous and full of glory and ready to stand and judge the world. For if the truth of God has more abounded through my lie unto his glory, or in other words, if my lie gives greater revelation to his truth, then why am I judged as a sinner? Because my lie would seem to do a good thing. It would be as if we were to say, I desire more of God's forgiveness. So in order to receive more of his forgiveness, I'll sin more. And that's what Paul says in verse 8. Some say that we say, let us do evil that good may come. But the people who say these things, their damnation is just. This is a foolish way of thinking. We are to return to what God always intended us to be through the choices that we make day by day. And we are not to allow the excuse that we are sinners by nature to compel us to continue to sin. Now remember, Paul is speaking about the unbelieving Jew, the Jew that has not received Christ as their Savior. They have not experienced the grace of God offered through the Lord Jesus Christ. And even though they are the first people that God began to work among, and they have rejected their Messiah, we as Christians are not in a better position than them. And that's what he says in verse 9. He says, what then? Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. They are all in the need of grace. They must all come out from unbelief and become believers and followers of the Lord Jesus. For left on their own, there is none righteous, not one. There is none on their own who understands the ways of God. There is none on their own that seeks after God. They are all Jews and Gentiles gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none left on their own that doeth good, not a single one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they've used deceit. Do you remember what James told us in chapter 3, verse 6? The tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. In chapter 8, it says, The tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Well, Paul says, Men left on their own speak deceit. And the poison of asps or vipers is under their lips. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. Why? Because Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And without abiding in Jesus, we cannot know peace. Ultimately, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They only think of the here and now and all that it can provide for them. 
They think little of the consequences when they stand before the Almighty. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Why? Because as in Galatians chapter 3, verse 24, it says, The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Verse 25, after that faith is come, however, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. So the law is there to point us in the right direction, showing that we have need of forgiveness because we've broken the law in so many ways. And so realizing that we are all sinners, that we've broken the laws of God, every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God because there are none that can stand before him with excuse. Therefore, it is by the deeds of the law that no flesh shall be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. And it is here at this point in the letter that the complexity of this truth is going to become so confusing. Because it's going to seem at one point Paul says one thing, and yet just a few verses later he contradicts himself. Let me give you an example. In, in chapter 2 and verse 13, Paul says, Not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. The doers of the law shall be justified. Well, we just read in chapter 3 verse 20, By the deeds of the law or those who do the law, no flesh shall be justified. Now, taken alone, those two passages contradict themselves. And so here's where we're going to have to remember the simple truth. To the Jew, it is the law that justifies. To the Christian, because we are justified, we surrender to the law. And so it's an absolute shift in both understanding and practice. And that was a very difficult concept for the Jewish people to grasp. And it's a very difficult concept for you and I to grasp. But it's rather simple if kept in its simplicity, friends. We're not working to receive, but because we have received, we are working. Well, I hope I've been helpful in helping you better understand what Paul is trying to say at this portion in his letter. If not, and you stay with us, I think it will become clearer to you as we move from chapter to chapter. Well, we'll close there today, friends, and I trust your day will be blessed in Jesus, that your heart will be full of joy, and that your lips will be full of praise. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I truly love you, and I'll see you on the next video.